Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us here today. I'm so excited to welcome back Ron Martinson. Hi Ron. Hey, how's it going? Good, thanks so much for coming back. Um, he is here to present Spice Up Your Images Without HDR. He's going to be using products like Topaz Adjust, Black and White Effects, Quick Look at Lens Effects, and Denoise, and um, other techniques as well. So I'm super excited to welcome him back. So let me tell you a little bit about Ron, and then I'll turn it over to him for the fun stuff. Uh, Ron Martinson is a well-known international photography and photo editing blogger. If you've never been to his blog, please go check it out. It is very cool. It's ronmartblog.com. While his images are featured in magazines around the world, his real passion is photography education. His blog has enjoyed over one million visitors with topics ranging from gear, plugins, and book reviews. And there's a ton of content on there, so definitely check it out. Ron is the author of Printing 101 Notebook, an introduction to fine art photography printing, as well as two other best-selling books. Andy has been featured on numerous blogs from industry leaders like Scott Kelby, Joe McNally, Trey Ratcliffe, John Paul Caponegro, and more. So with that, I will go ahead and turn this over to the man you guys are all here to see. So what I wanted to talk about today was about spicing up your images without uh, using HDR. And what I noticed uh, from you know, working with my students is that um, People will get fascinated about uh, HDR and, and refer to uh, something that really actually is an HDR. HDR is merging multiple images of different exposure together to create one image that has a larger dynamic range than you can get with a single uh, image uh, from your camera. But what they typically are trying to do is to get that, that HDR look um, that you see you know, people like Trey Ratcliffe and others uh, pull off very successfully. And so it's really about the look that they get to that finishing step. And so when I watch them do their HDRs, they end up uh, not really taking advantage of a whole lot of that information, and they focus a lot of time on the tone mapping, which is the final phase uh, after the HDR merge, um, and to try to get that special look. So um, I won't be covering HDR today. I'll be covering um, how to get some of those similar kind of looks. Um, without actually uh, resorting to having to take multiple exposures. And the cool part about that is, is that um, you can go take your existing images that you have um, and get the same kind of look. And also, uh, you know, if you have, um, you, you do need a little bit more dynamic range. If you have one raw file, you can do a single uh, exposure uh, HDR and get some of that you know, expanded dynamic range and then apply these effects and get most of the effect that I think most people are actually out to get. And so this is about creating cool, you know, vivid, exciting photos. And uh, let's go ahead and get started with one that I did here in, uh, from a roof of a building in New York City. I think you probably saw this uh, on the Topaz uh, Facebook site today. And this is how that photo started. Um, I was dangling off of a building, um, uh, literally you know, hand-holding this shot uh, at uh, one eighth of a second with you know, the straps wrapped around my wrist and my palms sweating. Um, and it was uh, probably one of the most uh, scary shots I've had to do because I literally had no straps or safety straps or anything hanging my body over the, the uh, edge here. And so this was really the best I could do. I couldn't use uh, a tripod where I was, um, I, one, because I didn't have it with me, but even if I did, um, it just wasn't very a good view from the roof. Uh, you had to be hanging over the side of the building to get this shot. And I believe it or not, I've actually done it twice, uh, different uh, different years apart. So um, I survived. And um, and so I really wanted to give this uh, image some oomph and uh, you know, not make it quite so boring. So um, let's go ahead and get started with an example of how I do that. So started off with my background image, and then I used uh, Denoise. Um, to do the noise reduction. I'm not going to do that. I'll use denoise later today, but I didn't do it for this one just because I had a complex mask I needed to create. I wanted to have that mask handy for this demo. Um, but this is just running uh, denoise with some of the default settings. <clears throat> and then from here, let's see, I went ahead and created a new layer. So the way I usually create new layers is uh, Control-Alt-Shift-E for the PC or uh, Command-Alt-Shift-E on the Mac. Um, to merge everything into a new layer. And then we'll go to Filter Topaz Labs and go to Adjust 5. And I like the Adjust 4 uh, preset list. 
Um, those are a lot of the ones, and this is actually done in Adjust 4 originally, and I like a lot of those old classic um, presets, so uh, go there. And let's start with Dramatic, which you can already, if you've seen the image, you know that this is really one of the key steps um, as this filter. It kind of gives, gives it that look, um, brings a lot of detail out of the clouds, and kind of uh, yeah, adds a little bit more uh, excitement and some really cool uh, colors and stuff. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go over to, uh, actually, excuse me, finishing touches. And I like this effect, but if I don't want to do quite this much of it, um, kind of tone it back a little bit, what I can do is I can use this transparency, which is if you've used transparent or uh, opacity in Photoshop, it's just the opposite. It's kind of confusing to me, actually. Um, if I wanted to do 80% opacity, I would set this to 20% uh, or 0 0.20, and it gives me 80% opacity. I come down here to one, that's no opacity, or, um, and then zero, uh, that's 100% hey, opacity to use Photoshop. Yeah. We are not seeing the right side of your screen. Is it on all on? Uh, yes. It is. Okay. We can change a, do a screen resolution change if you want. Um, it's Let's not see. the screen. Is that, okay. I mean, I can bring this down. Uh, are you seeing the right side of Photoshop? No, we're not. So let's go ahead and try that screen resolution to see if that Okay, sure. Give me okay. a second here. Um, Sorry about that, everybody. A little technical um, issue. <laughs> no let's see if that's 1680 by 1050. I had earlier work. Yes, that's um, working for us. Okay, maybe because we did it while I was connected. Um, yeah, I think because we did it while it was in session. That's probably why. So like okay. sorry, everybody, but now I think we're good to go. So we'll let you continue with that, Ron. Okay, yeah, and I'll just point out over here. I started off with my uh, noise reduction layer and um, duplicated it to go or merged up to the top um, to create my new layer, and then we're back in adjust again. So again, back over here to transparency. So zero means you know 100% opacity show the whole effect. One means don't show it at all. And for this one, um, you know, I just people ask me how do you choose these numbers? It's just gut feel. Um, I go back and forth and kind of slide around until it's, I feel like yeah, that feels about right. Um, and I lowered this one down to uh, 0 0.20. So I'm going to click OK. And what I like to do with my layers um, for my use later on is to label them so I know uh, where I got that look and when I did. So I do adjust five, um, and then I'll say uh, transparency point zero point two zero. Actually, let's make that a little wider since we're doing that. Okay. And then I'll um, repeat that step of creating a new layer. Command Shift Escape. Uh, excuse me. Uh, command Command Alt Shift E or Control Alt Shift E. And let's go back until that's adjust five again. Now this time I'm going to choose Spiceify, which kind of darkens things up. And just for kicks and giggles, I'm going to click OK here. And I'm going to lower the opacity this time down to about 70%. Cause that's all that I want for this effect. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here to my noise reduction layer. I've separated my city from my sky. I'm going to uh, control click to load that selection. I'm going to come up here to this layer and create a new layer, which will apply the effect just to the sky. But actually, I want to apply it just to the city. So I'm going to do a control uh, I or command I. So I inverted uh, this noise reduction layer uh, or mask so that it just impacts the city and gives me the look that I want without doing anything to the clouds. I didn't like what it was doing to the clouds there. 
So if I disable the layer mask, you can see kind of made them a little red um, and brought out a little bit more detail than I wanted at this time. So the before and after, you can kind of see what that's doing there. It's giving a lot more um, detail and uh, kind of brightens up a lot of the buildings. Um, and so now that I've done that, let's call this the just five, spiceify 70%. And the really reason I chose opacity over the transparency is just to show you both techniques. Both work exactly the same way. Um, where the transparency comes in real handy is if you're in um, Lightroom and you don't have Photoshop to go back to where you can change your uh, opacity. So next, let's do another new merged layer. And we're going to go back to Adjust 5 again, in case you can't tell, I like Adjust 5 quite a bit. And if you watch any of uh, my friend Trey Ratcliffe's videos, you'll notice that he's a pretty big fan of uh, Adjust as well. Um, it's kind of his secret sauce. And so I'll go to uh, HDR Collection, and then I'll choose Dynamic Pop 2. And one of the questions that uh, people ask me often when I'm doing these uh, uh, types of demos for them one-on-one -on -one. is they're like, you know, how do you come up with these? It's like, this is so, uh, um, you just go so fast and, you know, you just seem like to know which ones to use and stuff. And, and honestly, the way it works is um, I'll spend a lot of time just experimenting on an image, you know, clicking through. And, you know, because this is something that I've prepared for, I can just go through it and quickly pick, you know, the filters and set all the settings. But the actual process of doing it's a big experimentation. So instead of, you know, editing an image here in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, it might take me, you know, a couple hours. And a lot of it's just going through, clicking on things and saying, hmm, I wonder what that would look like. And let's slide this slider around, slide that slider around, see what happens. And so, um, you know, it's, it's just uh, a lot of experimentation at the end of the day. So now that I have that layer added, I'm going to go, uh, once again, go click on my layer mask, and down below, create a new layer. And uh, this time I'm going to just leave um, that same layer mask. So what you'll see this did was it just impacted the uh, sky instead of the city. And just gave the sky a little bit more interesting look. A lot better than what Spicify had done. It's a little more detailed, all that red um, that the uh, Spicify would have given it. And so uh, I really like that look. And so now you can see this is pretty much the final image that you see online um, before and after. And it didn't take too long, and we're really just using a few effects. Um, actually, add my comment. Always comment my layers. Be dynamic. Uh, two. So, um, one of the things that I often get as the FAQ whenever I show this image is um, what were my, uh, what camera did I use, what were my settings. This was a uh, 5D Mark II using the 8 to 15 millimeter fisheye zoom at 15 millimeters, ISO 1600, and it was at F4 for one eighth of a second. And people say, why F4? Why didn't you use F11? because I didn't want to dangle over that building any longer than I had to. Um, so <laughs> since this was handheld, you make compromises, and when there's wind blowing and you're dangling from the side of a building, you want to get the hell off of there as fast as you can. And it still took about 20 exposures before I finally got one that was stable because my arms were shaking so much um, trying to get this shot. So um, I did repeat it with a 5D Mark III and haven't had a chance to process it yet. Probably should have done that today. So let's go ahead and close that. Now we're going to do um, another one uh, from Seattle. Let me go get that file. What we're going to do here is kind of the same sort of pattern. Um, the way I started off this image um, was that it looked like that. And the mountain was, was pretty cool, but I wanted to brighten it up, so I just kind of yeah, added a little bit of... Uh, uh, brightness there, just a simple um, uh, curves adjustment and uh, masked, uh, masked out everything except for the mountain. Did a little mid-tone adjustment to add a little bit more detail to that mountain. 
Um, but that's pretty much how it came out. This is, there's no um, other Photoshop magic happening there. It was, it was a really cool day, um, which is why I actually uh, stopped and went and shot that uh, really cool view. Um, and then I did some uh, noise removal again. Nothing fancy. I'll show the noise later. So uh, I just wanted to show that I used some noise removal there. And then uh, let's get a new layer going. And then we're going to go back to adjust five, and we're going to do um, the psychedelic filter this time, which is kind of a wild one. When you see that one at first, you're like, "Oh my god!" This is one of the things I encourage people to do when you're doing your experimentations. Is even though a filter may look, you know, awful like this when you first click it, still experiment. Play around with the sliders, play around transparency or opacity, depending on where you are, and see what it does. Um, sometimes you might be really pleasantly surprised, a uh, really cool effect that you get. Um, and so let's go to uh, adaptive exposure. And um, actually, before I do that, I want to go to details first. Because one of the things about this particular filter right away is you see it's how it's really nasty looking all through it up here. Uh, you can actually even see some of my little touch-ups that I had done. If I come here and just simply say process details independently, bam, big difference right off the bat. It gets rid of that kind of ugly, uh, grungy look. Still needs work, but it's a lot better than it was before. Um, so that's one of the uh, first things that I'll experiment anytime I use one of these filters is like, what does that do? Does that make any difference? Huh, okay, I like that or I don't like it. You'll notice we'll figure out once I did in the last demo, I wasn't um, clicking that effect. Um, just, you know, felt like it was fine for the others, but for this one, you definitely need it. Um, and so then let's go back to adaptive exposure. And what I'll do with this is um, I'll just, you know, slide this thing back and forth. Like, what's the maximum it's going to do, okay? Makes a lot things a lot brighter. Minimum pretty much turns the effect off. You know, what's, what's the right value? And for this one, I ended up around here. And I'll experiment with these, and a lot of times they'll say, you know, the original was fine. If you ever want to go back to the original value, just click this um, but, uh, button here, and it will set this group back to its original value. <coughs> now we'll go down to details. And for this one, I was, again, experimenting with strength. That's no strength. That looks really bad. And that's max strength. That looks really bad. And let's uh, try to find, find a value that feels good. And I ended up around somewhere around here. <coughs> Excuse me. And one thing you'll notice that uh, on this webinar, things look a little bit smeared. That's just because I'm not running at the native resolution of my display, and this you know, large image is being kind of compact um, in a tight area. Um, when I do this, at my full resolution, um, you know. I'm seeing things a lot clearer and nicer, and you'll see that when we go to Photoshop. So don't let the kind of you know blurriness um, that you're seeing for the demo throw you. Next, we I went down to uh, color, and I played around with the adaptive saturation and just kind of saying, okay, what is it? If I crank this up, it makes the building's uh, lights a little bit more yellow. I like that. If I turn it off, you know, things are a little bit more gray. So I kind of moved around until I felt like about 0.42 was where I liked it. <coughs> then I um, also boosted up my uh, saturation again. Let's see what it does. If I do that, it kind of affects all the colors, especially affects the blues. Um, and so with that in mind, I set this around 1.01. .01. 1.03, that's good enough. Um, it kind of gives it that nice, really blue uh, in the sky and throughout the scene, uh, especially this ugly building here. For the final image, I actually end up cropping all this stuff off the bottom and off the top. And this is one exposure from a 5D Mark II that I printed um, at uh, 54 inches uh, wide by 24 inches tall. Turns out totally fine using a, a Canon uh, IPF. Uh, 6300 printer. So um, 
Let's see. Next step was uh, noise. So this image, because um, I'm doing a lot to it, and especially because I'm using the um, filter here that uh, adds a lot of noise, um, what I do for noise here is I always choose, because I have Topaz do noise, I always choose check Topaz do noise. And what that does is just uses do noise instead of the uh, noise reduction that's built into Topaz uh, Adjust 5. I have it, so I assume it does a better job. Um, and so I click, click that checkbox, and then I uh, set the suppression uh, for this one to about 1.53. And again, this is just eyeballing it. Um, usually I do that at 100%. Um, and just kind of look at various areas around the image to see you know, what's, what's happening with the noise. And it's just to kind of clean things up. So once I had that, click OK. And that's pretty much all I did for this um, to get my before and after. So you can see before, kind of dull, interesting, you know, great day, but not really exciting, kind of muddy. And then after. Bam, yeah, really exciting. And some people say, you know, oh, it feels a little too oversaturated for me and stuff. Well, you know what? Yeah, you can do this, and you can kind of dial it back, um, you know, to whatever your taste is. Um, that's the cool part about working with layers and um, you know, adjusting your opacity or transparency if you're uh, just in Lightroom and using um, adjust directly from Lightroom. So that's Seattle. Next up, we're going to do another one from Seattle. This one's going to be uh, the Space Needle. And we're going to do this just so we can kind of show off uh, something interesting to do with the clouds. So this was uh, a situation where my daughter and I were at the Space Needle, and we were just about to leave. And I looked up, and I thought, wow, the clouds sure do look cool. So I just took a shot of the clouds. And it really wasn't um, a super exciting shot. I mean, I literally just put, just put the camera up, hit it shot and hopped in the car and drove off. <laughs> and so um, I wanted to give it some more oomph. And whenever I think of giving you know, an image more oomph, I think of going to adjust. And so I came in here to adjust 5. And uh, this time I went back to my uh, psychedelic filter again, which during demos I seem to have a problem to find that one. There we go. OK. And you see, wow, cool. That bring out, brings out a lot of really, really cool details uh, in the clouds. Um, and so if I come over here to details and I check my process details independently, it kind of takes a little crunch out of there. You might like it more with it on, more with it off. That's kind of up to you. For me, I liked it better uh, with the process and details independently. That gave me just the right amount, not feeling too overdone. Um, it did make my image, this filter makes my image a little bit more yellow, but I'll deal with that later in a different way. So, oops, click OK. And so that was pretty much um, all I did with this one. So if you look at my uh, layers here, what I did for the final result is that I removed the yellow cast. So let me actually just do that. Um, it kind of had a little bit too much you know, yellow color on the space needle. So I just did a little bit of use saturation adjustment on the uh, whole image. I didn't mind that it impacted the clouds a little bit. I figured that was fine. And then I just did a transformation of the perspective on there so the space needle didn't look oval. It looked in more round. And that was it. So yeah, pretty simple uh, image to take. And um, you know, blessed by the gods of the clouds, and thanks to Adjust, I had a really cool effect. Again, if this were a final image, I would rename my layer. So I knew what to do, uh, or knew how I got that effect. So one of the things I find, too, is, you know, if I label my layers and later on when I'm thinking, you know, I was experimenting a lot. How did I get that effect for that image? I want that kind of similar effect for my current image. I can go back, load the file, look at the layer, and um, you know, see my tips, uh, essentially, what they are in those uh, layer names. So this one here is one that's going to be a lot more complicated, but um, it kind of gets a lot of oohs and ahs uh, from people because it's it's really easy to do. It's a lot of steps, but it's really easy to do and really creates um, that HDR look that we're talking about. All these images um, kind of have 
that you know, finished HDR look that you see uh, on the web. But this one um, probably gets wrong? a little bit more. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. You had said you wanted kind of a little time check at about okay. 30 minutes into the hour. So we are there. So just to give you okay. a heads up. <laughs> Great. Thanks. I'm going to move a little quicker for this one then. So that way we're sure to get this and hopefully one more in. Um, and so what we're going to do, uh, I already created the, the layer here. And I'll show you the effect when we're done. Um, we're going to go ahead and do HS5. And this time, I'm going to do um, go to the Vibrant Collection, and I'm going to choose Autumn, uh, which I, was my last selected. That's why it actually shows up like that. And this just makes the image a little bit more warm. And the really fun thing about this demo is I use a lot of filters, but I don't really actually do much tweaking with them. Um, I just kind of do this for fun one day, and it all kind of came together nicely. Um, and I'm not going to rename my layers now just for the sake of time. Next up, we're going to go back to adjust again. And then this time, we're going to go over to, um, let's see, I want to make sure I get the right layer here. We're going to go to adjust four. We're going to choose Spicify. And this kind of creates a little bit uh, too much black in here. I didn't really like that. So what do I say I do often? I'll go into details and see what process, process details independently does. Gets rid of some of the crunchiness, and then I'll deal with some of the black issues later. Click OK. Create a new layer. Go back to adjust. And again, this is all experimentation. Just keep playing with layers and seeing how things look together. Um, probably deleted 10 layers um, along the way as I was doing my experimentations. <laughs> so let's see. Now we want to do the photo pop preset. Just kind of just adjust the colors a little bit. And yeah, you may be noticing that some of the details look a little crunchy. Don't worry. I'll get to that um, towards the end. And so. Um, one of the things I didn't like about this one is I didn't like any of the details, so I just clicked that option off. You can kind of see before and after. It kind of uh, makes these ferns and stuff look a little too crunchy, so I turned that off. And that's one of the things that's common. You know, If you're stacking a bunch of different layers together, each one's trying to do a little bit of sharpening for you. You don't want all that, so you, know, you typically want to turn details off if you get too many going. And so, um, now, you know, my image is starting to get a little bit noisy as well. So I decided, you know, it's time to probably go kill some noise. And so um, let's go to filter. Oops. Do noise. And you can kind of see all that noise in there. Um, realistically, I should have done a uh, noise layer to begin with. But since the way I did this workflow and I did it the first time was I was just experimenting around. I wasn't sure what I was even going to do with this image, and I really wasn't out to process it. I was just kind of playing around one day. Um, so it's common to find yourself like, yeah, I should have gone back and done this, but I don't want to go back and redo all that work again. So um, you can do it later. It's better to do it first, but you can do it later. And so I chose JPEG Lite preset. That kind of smoothened things, things up enough for me, and I was satisfied with that. This is a shot for me. It's not really a shot for a client or anything. Um, and I was happy with that level of uh, noise reduction. For the best possible result, you want to do your noise reduction first before you start adding all these filters and paying attention along the way. But you can see it looks nice. Um, there's so much going on in this shot, you're not going to tell that that's been you know, smooth too much. Um, and then let's see, let's do another layer here. And for this one, um, I just had gotten lens effects, so I started playing around with lens effects to see what I could do with it. And there's lots of cool things you can do in lens effects, but the one that I ultimately settled on for this one was actually a fairly simple one. I went to this um, warmth filter and chose warm three, just to make it feel a little bit more warm for the house. I didn't really want it on the uh, trees, but I really wanted it on the house. So click OK. 
And so since I didn't want it on the house, I just um, created a layer where I hold the Alt key down, create the new layer to create a black layer, which basically says don't apply the effect anywhere. <laughs> and then using my um, brush, I just came along here, um, switched it to white, and just added it back to the house. And I can kind of do this a little bit sloppy. Again, this is this is for me. The more time that I spend on this, uh, the better the result's going to be. So I'll just kind of hit some areas here a little bit, kind of come along this rope along here. And again, you can spend hours on this phase. So since I'm doing a demo, I'm just doing it really quick. And so that gave me the effect um, just in the areas that I wanted it and left my trees nice and green. <laughs> but I was looking at this and thinking, you know, I like what's going on here, but I really don't like what's happening with these trees. And it's still also feeling like it's maybe a little bit too much. I kind of over, overcooked it a little bit. So what I did was I moved all these layers into a group. Now the cool thing about doing this is that now I can turn off the effect or turn on the effect and say how much do I want from that uh, whole entire group. And so it treats them all as one, which is really great. And so I decided for this one, I thought about 75% was what I wanted versus that 100%, which was just a little bit overcooked. Um, so that was a big improvement. And then I said, you know, I like it, but I still don't like what's happening to these um, ferns and stuff. They still look like they've got a little bit too much um, crisp to it. So uh, I created a layer mask on my group. And you guessed it, you can uh, actually mask some things out there. So um, I got a black brush, set it to 30% opacity, and and I used 30% just as a starting point. I wanted to leave the effect in there, but not uh, completely remove it, but I wanted to dial it back. So I just, without lifting up, I just kind of came in and quickly painted over the trees. And again, we can be more precise with this for a final image. Um, and depending on how I'm going to use it, I'm just going to show this on the web or if I'm just going to print it um, you know, small. We don't really need to get too precise, but if you're going to print big, you got to be spot on precise. And so that kind of took some of the crispiness out of there, made things feel a little bit more real again uh, for the foreground where our eyes go. If I just lay up, disable that layer mask, you see it's crispy and enable. It's not. So made a big difference, I think. So let's go look at the before and after. Before, bam, after. And people, when, they see, when I show people this shot, they're like, oh, wow, you did HDR on that, huh? No, I didn't. I just processed it uh, at the end. But, you know, it brightens up the foreground, some of these shadow areas and stuff. And if I did HDR, it would probably help a little bit. So help brighten up some of the shadow areas. So one last quick demo. Hopefully we can squeeze this one in um, because it uses black and white effects that I think is cool. So I had done, uh, in the same uh, set here, I had done that exact same workflow we just talked about. Autumn, Spice, Fly, Pop, JPEG, Lens Effects, everything. Um, just kind of tinkering around saying, you know, I wonder what that effect would look like on this. It's the same environment. And I really liked the look. It looked really cool. I um, was really happy with it. But I felt like, you know, it would be cool to give it more of a rustic kind of old time feel. So. I created a new layer, and what I did there, a lot of people don't realize you can do this, but this is one of the ways I actually use black and white effects the most. Um, let's check this out. What I did was I came in and um, went to the Van Dyke Brown collection, and I uh, actually played around coffee dynamic is one, and russet dynamic is another. Um, and which one you use, yeah, it kind of depends. I mean, I just kind of click around and experiment, but I really liked um, Russet Dynamic. And if you're familiar with uh, black and white effects, this is a cool uh, feature of two, is that when I hover over these, it shows me the effect in this really nice big uh, preview window. That right there is one of the big reasons I like uh, black and white effects too. The UI is a lot cleaner and everything now. And so uh, what I did with this one is that I went down to Finishing Touches, 
um, went down to transparency. And I'm using my um, black and white effects layer as uh, a way to kind of mute the image a little bit, but still preserving a lot of what's there. And so for this one, um, I ended up with around 80%. Um, and so you see it kind of gives it an old time effect, kind of kills some of the brightness, but it still feels, you know, really nice and exciting. Um, also uh, decided that I didn't really want any noise in that film grain. There's already a lot of effects going on here, so I didn't want to add any noise, so I just cleared that out. And then um, I went to, uh, let's see, I wanted to add a little border on here and just wanted to make it solid black. And I'm going to show you something cool that I do with that later. <coughs> and then for vignette, I wanted a vignette, but the original is uh, too much. So the way I work with vignettes is I always turn on the maximum. You can do a black vignette or a white vignette. Um, for this one, I chose a black. And so I turn on the maximum so I can see what I'm doing for these others. You know, so when I change my size, I can actually see what's going on. So let's go to 70. And then when I transition, just kind of play around with it um, until I just it feels right. And that's when people ask me, you know, how you come with that value? It just it kind of felt right. Um, kind of just adds a little bit more circle. And so once I have that set, then I go back and dial back my strength um, to the way I wanted it, which for this one is somewhere around minus 0.2522, somewhere around there. <laughs> so click OK. You can see the before and after. I thought, you know, I like that, but I think I might have overdone it a little bit. And so I just lowered my opacity down to 90%. And the cool thing about doing that, which you can actually do intentionally with a black border, is if I zoom in here, you'll see a little bit of my image. Um, I used a lower res Im image for the demo, so it's kind of blocky. Uh, but you'll see some of the image bleed through, which actually is a really nice border effect. Um, so I'm going to go put that around here. So it's a little bit of bleed around the border, um, but it darkens it, keeps the viewer's eyes uh, in this really busy photo, uh, as does the kind of framing. And really, I think, a, a great result from the before and after. So with that, um, I'm done. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ron. That was a lot of information right there. I appreciate it. Let's see here. Um, I have a lot of questions coming through. So everybody, if you have any more questions, you can type them into your questions module. And I'll go ahead and try to get Ron to answer as many as we can here in the next um, 15 minutes or so, and then I will go ahead and announce the winners of Topaz Black and White Effects and Adjust, as well as give away the coupon code. All right, so I believe you answered this at the beginning, but we had a couple other people ask, uh, what camera lens did you use to get the curvature in the first image you showed, the one where you were hanging sure. off the balcony? <laughs> sure. yeah. That was uh, the Canon 8 to 15 millimeter um, fisheye zoom. I actually have a review of it right here on my blog, so you can go learn more about it there. Okay, so great. Um, and we had several people want to revisit the partial sky, uh, the masking, and the inversion that you did. So if you can go over sure. just that step within that um, particular image, that would be sure. no great. Problem. Thank you. So um, what I'll do here is I'll just show you what this mask looks like. Um, and you'll notice it's not perfectly precise. Um, again, if I'm going to print this up billboard size, it needs to be perfectly precise. Uh, it doesn't, uh, since the way that I use it's online and uh, 16 by 24 prints. <laughs> what I did was I just did a quick selection of the sky um, and kind of use that as my starting point, and then I just used a um, uh, uh, quick paint of the brush over these areas through here to kind of make it fit a little bit better, which is just current work. Um, masking is one of the hardest things to do. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to keep doing that during the demo, so I just saved it. <laughs> and so when I want to affect the city, I'll have a black and white. If I want to affect just the clouds, I'll do uh, Control-I, which inverts my... Um, uh, 
effect there. So let me go ahead and create a quick new layer. And then just for time's sake, I'll just do a quick curves adjustment. So if I press control click on a mask or on anything, it'll select that. So if I come in here, um, if I create a new layer, actually let's do this. If I create a new layer and I'm, I have a selection when I create a new layer, if I press this right here, it's going to create the uh, mask of whatever my selection is and get rid of my selection. So I have a selection now that affects just the sky. If I want it to affect just the city, I'll control I. See, so, uh, go back and forth on that. Uh, so that's all that I'm doing there. Okay. Is that good? Yeah, and then um, the oh, you already did the inverse. Yep, that was okay. the inverse. Control Sorry, <laughs> I'm answering questions at the same time. <laughs> all right, um, let's see here. With that particular image, can you tell us what your exposure was again as far as in your aperture settings? Sure. Um, yeah, I mentioned that one during the demo. It was uh, F4. Again, it should have been around F8 or F11 if I had a tripod. Um, but I chose F4 because I was hand-holding, and one-eighth of a second was um, as uh, steady as I could hold my hand and still get a sharp shot. And then uh, as an ISO 1600, um, again, you know, I didn't want to go any higher ISO than I had to, um, so I was trying to make a compromise there. Certainly, I would want a more depth of field if I had you know, a tripod and all things perfect, but given my circumstances, I made trade-offs, and it's a pretty successful shot, so I think I did the right thing ultimately. Some people don't like the distortion, but I kind of like how it feels like the curve of the earth. Um, you could remove that with uh, perspective control. Um, in you know, Lightroom or within Photoshop. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, let me look at some of these other questions that are coming through. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, Gustavo wants to know, do you always use this type of setup or workflow when you want to do an HDR effect and not, not true HDR, um, or is this or does each photo require different types of settings and different types of um, workflows? That's a good, a good question, and I experiment. Um, sometimes if I think a photo might, like this one here might benefit from HDR, I'll run it through uh, Photomatics or HDR effects, and, and sometimes I'll actually try both and, and kind of play around with it, see what the tone mapping does for me. And uh, sometimes if I feel it's overcooked or just isn't really working, uh, I'll come back and try it without it. Uh, sometimes if I don't have the exposures, then I'll just, you know, I don't really bother with um, doing uh, HDR, and I'll just uh, I'll apply the effect. Um, the key name of the game is experiment, and uh, adjust is really a cool product to say, you know what, I want to kind of give that the cool look, and but I don't really want to spend hours working on this with um, doing HDR. Um, so. As you see, the filters that I use here, Spiceify, Psychedelic, um, Dramatic, you know, they're, um, they're really good uh, filters to start with. Okay, great. And actually, that answers Al's question. He had asked you um, what your, you know, four or three favorite Topaz 5 Adjust filters are. So can you just repeat that one more time? <laughs> okay, sure. So, yeah, uh, Dramatic, Spiceify, and psychedelic, and I also used uh, dynamic pop um, during the demo, dynamic pop two during the demo, but uh, really spicify, psychedelic, and dramatic. Those are three that are really unique uh, within the Topaz world from any others. If you, do, you have um, plugins from other companies and say, hey, I want to try that, you can't get those effects uh, from them. From, at least I haven't been able to. Uh, and other people I've spoken to, if you kind of want these looks, you've got to go with Adjust uh, to get that cool look. Cool. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. With the uh, vantage point for your Seattle shot, Karen was asking, actually, just what was your vantage point for your Seattle shot? Oh, that's uh, Cary Park, really popular place in Seattle. Um, you'll be up there with it. It's kind of like going to the Grand Canyon. You'll be up there with a dozen other photographers if you shoot up there. And so you got to try to do something interesting and exciting. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, 
with the Seattle shot, Linda was asking if it would have been possible for you to, or see what how you would make the mountain stand out more, or would it would it be would you end up destroying it with noise? Yeah. So you know, for this photo, my subject is a space needle. Everything else is a secondary subject to my primary subject, which is the space needle. And so if I make this mountain too bright, then my eye is fighting back and forth going between the mountain and the space needle, and I don't want that. I like that the mountain's there. It adds a lot to this shot, but I don't want it to detract so much. So I just kind of, you know, give it a hint that it's there. Um, some people say, well, well, the mountain feels like it's floating a little bit. Well, you could darken it up a little bit on the bottom. Um, but I honestly, when most people look at it, there's so much to look at in this photo. You really don't uh, you know, and focus too much on you know, the mountain feeling like it's floating. Um, one of the things I do actually in the final image that I didn't show today is there's a little bit of haloing going on, and like in this area here and stuff. And so I go clean that up manually. But that's you know, time consuming, so I didn't want to do that during the demo today. Yeah, and a couple people were asking about that. I just wanted to comment. Um, if you don't have Photoshop and you'd rather just stay in the Adjust um, 5 um, mm -hmm. interface, you actually have the brush out feature in the local adjustments, so you don't necessarily have to have the layers to brush it out or do the masking. You can do that within Adjust 5, because I, I had several questions about how do I get rid of you know um, a halo around a building or, or anything like yep. that. So definitely exactly. check that out. Yep. And again, you know, this is one of those things that for the demo I cut out a lot of details. And also, you use what you're familiar with. Um, I use Photoshop a lot, so I'll, I'll go to that. But yeah, that's mm -hmm. the great thing about um, all these products is they have these finishing touches that allow you to make local adjustments and, and do it all within Lightroom without having to go to Photoshop. Yes. All right. I have a couple kind of more... Um just uh, questions for you specifically. Um, let's see. David wanted you to talk through some of the key differences in output of using this approach versus HDR, and, and you know what the which one you prefer. And yep. So what HDR is going to give me, and again, you know, you you're controlling the slider, so you can uh, control how much uh, dynamic range or how little dynamic dynamic range you want from the HDR uh, effects is that it's going to bring in more brightness into my dark areas. And for a shot like this, honestly, I really didn't want that. I got all the brightness I needed out of a single exposure. It's kind of one of the common complaints you uh, hear from people about, uh, you know, you hear some photographers really, like, I hate HDR, it's so cheesy. And what they're really complaining about is that, you know, the dark shadows add, you know, some you know, dimension to the photo, um, makes it feel a little more 3D. When I brighten all those up, yeah, it's a wider dynamic range, but it's not really as visually interesting uh, anymore. It kind of flattens out the image. So I like the dark shadows. And then I brighten things up quite a bit from the original that you can see. You know, things were dark and, and kind of flat. I brightened it up using these effects. So I got what most people would probably end up doing with a, um, you know, a final finished version if they used um, Photomatics or HDRFX uh, Pro. Um, that it kind of has that you know, vibrant colors and, and everything. But what I see people doing when they're actually working through their HDRs is they end up um, either going way overboard and it looks awful, honestly, or they end up, as you're toning it back so much and spending so much time on the saturation and on the, um, the mid-tone uh, darks and stuff that they really don't really take advantage of the HDRness. And so those you know, three, six, seven exposures they took out in the field, or three, five, seven exposures they took out in the field really weren't necessary. They wasted a lot of time and, and um, disk space on getting an effect that could have been done with just one exposure. So, uh, and sometimes, you know, you don't have those other exposures. That's, that's another big reason. Yeah, I did that shot. It's like, gosh, I wish I had that HDR. Uh, I can't. Well, let's see what I can do with it. Uh, let's, let's make the best of what I've got. Great, thanks. Um, also, I have kind of a similar kind of uh, speaking about more of the HDR effect and, and when and how it's used and in the client world. Uh, Tony says um, his clients love looking at the more HDR, the more heavier HDR type of effects, but will never let him use it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he says, um, uh, 
do you have any clients that really go towards this look and um, where do you find yourself really using this uh, more HDR type of look? Is it pretty successful for you out in the real world? Yeah, no, actually it is. And and so, you know, naturally where HDR is really the most uh, heavily used in, in the, the field is with real estate photography where you have the classic problem of the bright window, um, you know, out to outdoors and then the dark uh, building inside and you can't get possibly get that. And those are legitimate cases where you'll use uh, uh, you know, true HDR to deal with um, really needing two exposures in one frame. <laughs> and But the kind of like the HDR effect I'm calling here, which is really what you do in tone mapping uh, after you've done your HDR merge, um, this is really more for the artistic uh, type of stuff, stuff that you sell in galleries or stuff that you do um, um, for advertisements and uh, stuff that needs to get attention. Um, you know, this isn't something for realist, uh, photorealistic. Um, but again, as I mentioned, you can also tone things back. It doesn't always have to be, it comes out like this, you're like, hey, that's great, I love it. The client says, mm, it's a little overcooked for me, I don't really like that. Okay, dial it back. You know, if I dial this back to about 42%, it's not feeling as heavy. And if you look at before and after, it still makes a difference. So, you know, don't be afraid that, um, kind of let your imagination run wild, have fun with it. And then if you feel like you overcooked it, just play around with opacity. And again, in, uh, if you don't have Photoshop, you can use the transparency feature uh, with an adjust to actually experiment with that. And you would just do it on your final um, layer that you worked, or you know, final adjustment that you made in adjust. This one uses just one, so it's easy. But if you use multiple, then your last one, you would just kind of play around with the transparency a little bit. Great, thank you. Um, let's see here. I had a couple. Actually, I believe you basically just answered Helene's um, question. She says, um, "Do you ever use a quick preset like Specify? Don't do anything else, and then go back and just fade it out in Photoshop to lessen the effect." Yeah, that was the uh, the second to last demo that I did, the tree mm -hmm. art, uh, tree house that was HDR like. Um, I wanted to show that a lot of times, you know. I'll just have a photo that I'm just looking at and I'm like, you know, I don't have time to edit it right now. Let's just go play with it for a few seconds though. You know, that famous, I'm only going to just work on this for a minute. It ends up being an hour. Um, and so I'll just kind of like load in some layers uh, without tweaking the dials and see what it looks like. And I'll use opacity just to slide the sliders. It's a really quick way to edit. And then if I really like it, but I'm like unsatisfied, dissatisfied with some certain areas, I may kind of save it for later and go back and redo it again and um, you know, make some slight different uh, changes. That's why I also label my uh, layers. So if I do that, I know how I got to that point, and then I know that I just need to maybe tweak detail or um, click that process details independently or something like that to go make the image look a little bit more interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. And I have a final question from Bob who says, what are your top four um, Topaz plugins? that you use? Top, top four Topaz plugins. So let's go over here. Oops. Select a layer so I can see. <laughs> and so I have uh, all of them on there. And so naturally, number one has to be adjust. Um, I like black and white effects a lot. Um, I'm, I'll be honest and say that uh, I, I use do noise, uh, but I actually um, did a lot of evaluation, a lot of different noise reduction products, and so it's not usually the first one that I go to. Um, but if I only had that, you know, I could certainly get things done, as I showed you in an example today. Um, I uh, in focus is really nice for recovering uh, images that you're, you know, you had a little bit of camera shake and stuff, and so I tend to use that one. Um, and then star effects uh, is is pretty cool as well. Remask is actually so. If I had to pick four, let's go ahead and say adjust is number one, remask is number two because creating those complex masks is a real pain in the butt. Um, number three would probably be black and white effects two now, and then number four would be in focus. So that's my top four. Cool, thank you. <laughs> but I also point out do the math, you know, with discounts and everything that the whole suite uh, versus buying, you know. Uh, five individually, let's say you did the four and decide you want to do the fifth later, you're, uh, ec uh, economics wise, you're usually better buying the whole suite than you are buying five, I think, 
Yes. yes, usually, especially with the ones you know that are a little bit, a little bit more. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ron. We have a lot of feedback. Everybody has really enjoyed this information and very impressed with the images. So thank you so much. Great. Thanks again. I hope everybody had a good time. And please visit my blog. Again, scan the right side of the blog for all the articles there. I know it's a little bit confusing and the uh, search doesn't always work as, as well as just looking at the index. So, uh, and like me on Facebook. I love, love uh, interacting with my readers on Facebook. Thanks again, Ron. Really appreciate it. And hopefully we can have you back soon. Okay, great. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Have a great day.